In this video, I'm going to expand on my explanation of the differences between the gradient operator del and the d operator, the exterior derivative. The original video on del versus d is in a link in the description, so please watch that one first if you haven't already. So if you watched the last video, you should already know the basic differences between del f and df. Del f, which I also called the gradient of f, is a vector field where the vector arrows point toward the positive values of f. On the other hand, df is a covector field where the covector curves are oriented towards the positive values of f. And the way we convert between the components of del f and df are by using these formulas here, which use the components of the metric tensor and the inverse metric tensor for the conversions. Now in this video I'd like to cover two other things. I'd like to do a more formal derivation of this formula for the components of df using the tensor product. And if you aren't familiar with the tensor product, I have links in the description to my videos that explain that. And the second thing I'd like to do is to give some examples of computing del f in different coordinate systems. So first I'm going to give a deeper explanation of this formula. So to explain this formula, we're going to need to understand the tensor product of two covectors. So given this vector basis here, E1 and E2, we can define the covector basis epsilon1, epsilon2 using this formula here. So these are the basis vectors E1, E2, and these are the basis covectors epsilon1, epsilon2. And to figure out the output of a covector stack acting on some vector v, we just count the number of lines that the vector pierces. So in this example, the output would be 2. So given some vectors and covectors, we know how to figure out the outputs. Now what the tensor product of two covectors creates is a sort of double covector. It's a function that takes two vector inputs, and to compute the output, we just pass the vectors to the covectors like this. And we just multiply the outputs of each of these two covectors here. So speaking informally, these four tensor products of the epsilon basis covectors are sort of kind of like these four matrices here. So this tensor product of covectors acting on the vectors v and w, if we write this in array notation, we would write it like this, using this matrix for epsilon 1 tensored with epsilon 2. And churning through the array multiplications, we get the first component of v multiplied by the second component of w. And that is exactly the output of epsilon 1 acting on v multiplied by the output of epsilon 2 acting on w. So when we want to compute the output of the metric tensor acting on two vectors v and w, the output is equal to this summation formula here. Or equivalently, we could write it out in array notation like this. So this metric tensor array here can be written as a linear combination of these matrices. So in a sense, the metric tensor, which takes two vector inputs, is sort of like a double covector. And we can write out the metric tensor as a linear combination of tensor products of covectors, where each of these tensor products is a bit like one of the matrices I showed earlier. And we can write this linear combination using the Einstein notation like this. So the v and w vectors can be written as a linear combination of basis vectors, which can be written in Einstein notation like this, and the metric tensor, which can be written as a linear combination of covector tensor products, can be written in Einstein notation like this. So when we want to compute v dot w, which is equal to the metric tensor acting on v and w, we can just expand g, v, and w out into their linear combinations. And then we can pass these vectors to the tensor product of covectors like this. And since the covectors are linear, we can take out these scalar constants and put them in front. And these, by definition, will become Kronecker deltas. And finally, we can use the index cancellation rule for Kronecker deltas to get this final formula here. So this is the formula for the dot product of v and w. Now, if we want to compute the components of the covector v dot something, we can just give the metric tensor one vector input and leave the second vector input slot empty. And so we can expand out the metric tensor and the vector v as linear combinations. And we can pass this vector to the first covector as an input. And by linearity, we can take these scalars out in front. And this again becomes a Kronecker delta. And we can cancel out the indexes to get this. So as you can see, the covector v dot something can be expanded out as a linear combination of the basis covectors, which are the epsilons.
So that derivation relied on an understanding that the metric tensor is a linear combination of covector tensor products, and also knowing how basis covectors act on basis vectors. Now to get the calculus versions of these formulas, we replace these basis covectors with the basis covector fields DCI and DCJ, where C stands for Cartesian and C1 equals X and C2 equals Y. And these DC covector fields are defined by this formula here, where DCJ, acting on the partial derivative of CI, gives us the Kronecker delta. And these formulas are actually true for any coordinate system, not just the Cartesian one, but I'm going to be using the Cartesian coordinates just to make things simple. So we can use a similar line of thought when calculating del f dot v, which is the same as the metric tensor acting on del f and v. We just expand everything out as linear combinations, where g is a linear combination of covector tensor products, and the vectors are expanded out as linear combinations of basis vectors, which are these partial derivative operators. And we can get the covectors to act on the vectors, like this, and then take the scalars out in front, and then turn these into Kronecker deltas, and then cancel these indexes to get this formula. And we saw this in the previous video. And if we want to get the components of del f dot something, we just remove the vector input and go through the exact same steps. So expand in linear combinations, give the vector to the covector, pull the scalars out in front, turn this into a Kronecker delta, and then cancel the indexes. And so you can see that del f dot something is really just a linear combination of basis covector fields dcj with these as the components. So I've shown you that this formula is correct. Now I'm going to go through a couple examples of computing del f in two different coordinate systems. So this will involve the C coordinate system and the D coordinate system. And in each one, we'll need to compute the inverse metric tensor components and these partial derivatives. And remember that these basis vectors are just the same things as these partial derivative operators. So the C coordinate system will be our standard Cartesian coordinate system where C1 is just X and C2 is just Y. And the basis vectors are these partial derivatives here. Now our D coordinate system will be given by these transformation equations here. So we basically just double the number of grid lines. So you can see that in the C system, this point would have the coordinates 1, 1. But in the D coordinate system, the same point would have the coordinates 2, 2. So just as this formula says, we basically just multiply the C coordinates by 2 to get the D coordinates of the same point. And the reverse transformation would be the opposite, just multiplying by 1 half. So given these coordinate transformations, we can compute the Jacobian matrix, also called the forward transformation matrix. And if you compute all these derivatives, you'll find that you get this matrix here. Now remember that we can use the Jacobian matrix to convert between the basis vectors in each coordinate system. And since the Jacobian matrix is just the identity matrix multiplied by one half, we can write these Jacobian matrix components as the Kronecker delta multiplied by one half. And if we cancel these indexes, we get this formula here. And this makes sense. It's telling us that the D basis vectors are half as long as the C basis vectors. So remember this formula because we're going to be using it later. Now let's consider the metric tensor matrix for the C coordinate system. Remember that the metric tensor matrix is just a matrix of the basis vector dot products. And for the Cartesian coordinate system, where the basis vectors are orthonormal so that they have length one and are perpendicular to each other, the metric tensor is just the identity matrix. So this is basically by definition for the Cartesian coordinate system, the metric tensor is the identity matrix, or if you like, the components are just the Kronecker delta. Now let's compute the metric tensor components for the D coordinate system. These are just the basis vector dot products for the D system. Now remember, in the D system, the D basis vectors are half the length of the C basis vectors, so we can write them like this. And we can pull both of these factors out in front and multiply them to get one quarter. And these dot products of the C basis vectors are just the metric tensor components in the C system, which if you recall, this is just the Kronecker delta.
So the metric tensor components in the D system are the Kronecker delta multiplied by one quarter. So it's basically a matrix with one quarter along the diagonal. And the values of one quarter make sense, since you'll notice that this square made by the basis D vectors is one quarter the size of this square made by the C basis vectors. Now let's take a look at the inverse metric tensor. For the Cartesian system, the metric tensor components are the Kronecker delta. So that means that the inverse metric tensor components are also the Kronecker delta, since the inverse of the identity matrix is also the identity matrix. Now for the D system, if the metric tensor components are the Kronecker delta with a factor of one quarter here, then the inverse metric tensor components will be the Kronecker delta with a factor of four because the diagonal matrix of fours is the inverse of a diagonal matrix with one quarters. Okay, so that's basically everything we need to figure out about the coordinate systems themselves. Now let's try looking at a function. So let's say we have this function in the C coordinate system here. Now if we wanted to visualize this, the function would look like this, where red are positive values and blue are negative values and white represents the value of zero. So in order to get a formula for the function in the D coordinates, we need to do these substitutions for the C1 and C2 variables, and so we get this. So the formulas for F in the two coordinate systems are different. Now remember, to compute del F, we need the partial derivatives of F. So it's not too hard to see that if we compute these partial derivatives, we get these values here. Okay, so we now have everything we need to compute del F. So let's compute it in the C system first. So we know that the inverse metric tensor components are just the Kronecker delta, so we can write this and cancel the J indexes to get this. Now, if we expand this summation explicitly in terms of C1 and C2, we'll get this. And we can replace these partial derivatives of F with one and two, as we calculated before. So this shows us that the del F vector field has components one and two. Now let's compute del F in the D system. So the inverse metric tensor components are the Kronecker delta multiplied by four. And again, we can cancel out these J indexes. And again, we can expand this summation out explicitly in terms of D1 and D2, and we get this. And we can replace these partial derivatives with the values of one half and one. And if we do these multiplications, we see that del F in the D coordinate system has the components two and four, which we could also write like this. So in the C coordinate system, the components of del F would be one, two. So that would be a vector that looks like this. And of course, since del F is a vector field, that vector is repeated everywhere in space. But in the D system, the components are two and four, which seems different, but because the basis vectors in the D system are half as long, we end up getting the exact same vector field as before. So the vector field del F is invariant. The geometric vectors are always the same and don't depend on the coordinate system but the components of del F might look different in different coordinate systems because the basis vectors in each coordinate system are different. And so to get the correct components of del F in a given coordinate system, we really do need both the partial derivatives of the function F and the inverse metric tensor components for that coordinate system. If we forget about the inverse metric tensor components, then we're going to end up with the wrong answer. So again, all these extra factors in the formulas for del F in cylindrical and spherical coordinates, these are just components of the inverse metric tensor for that coordinate system. So keep in mind that if a textbook ever tells you that the gradient of a function looks like this, or that the del operator is like a list of partial derivative operators, this is really only true in the Cartesian coordinate system, where the inverse metric tensor components are the identity matrix and they don't really matter that much. But in general, in most other coordinate systems, this isn't true, and we'll need to use the inverse metric tensor components to get the correct formula for del F.